Hey there, in this video, I'm gonna be talking about what I believe Canon needs to do in 2024. Now, if you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Josh. I am a videographer and a content creator. So I'll be focusing mainly on video stuff throughout this video and not really talking about photography. So disclaimer, this is an opinion piece. Now I own and use cameras from many different manufacturers, including Canon, but I also use cameras from Sony, Red, and Blackmagic. I've also tested a whole bunch of cameras and shared those experiences with all of you on this channel. In my opinion, Canon needs to shift some strategies with camera bodies and lenses. We'll get into both of these in this video. So let's start off by looking at some of the cameras that Canon released in 2023. From what I could find, I think there were four releases. There was the R8, the R50, the R100, and the PowerShot V10. So let's talk about these cameras. Let's start with the R8, which I think was Canon's most important release in 2023. Now this basically is a Canon R6 Mark II, which came out in late 2022 with a smaller body and a few less features for a much cheaper price point. The reason why I think this was such an important release for Canon was the fact that they offered a full frame photo camera for $1,500, which is very competitive in my opinion, a lot less than a lot of the other manufacturers out there and allowed people to get into the full frame market for a cheaper price. I think this was really important. But at the same time, it was basically a recycled R6 Mark II in a smaller body with less features. So there wasn't any innovation going on there. And you'll sort of see this trend with the other cameras. The R50 was the same sensor as the R10 with features removed to sell at a cheaper price point. The R100 has the same sensor from a much older camera, the M50 and the M50 Mark II, again, at a lower price point with less features to hit a different price point. And then there was the PowerShot V10, which most of us uh, didn't really put much thought into. I was very interested in this camera when it came out because it was something very different. Now at that price point, if you're trying to sell to people that are doing content creation and vlogging and stuff like that, and you're trying to sell them a pretty cheap camera, it's gotta be at least as good as the smartphones that people have in their pockets. And once I saw the image quality that was coming out of the camera, I didn't really think it was <laughs> the same or better. So uh, that was kind of a weird release. So in my opinion, there wasn't really any innovation or developments with any of these products. It was just getting our products to hit different price points. And I think that's kind of their strategy with a lot of the releases. Now, Canon is not the only company that does this. Sony, which is of course their main competitor, is putting out cameras like crazy and doing this often with taking more expensive cameras and putting them in either smaller bodies or stripping out features and selling them cheaper. But they're putting out a ton of cameras and they continue to do that throughout 2023. Also Lumix or Panasonic came out with two very competitive cameras, the S52 and the S52X. Both were packed full of value and had tons of features and were really focused at video stuff. So they have a lot of competition right now. And I think mainly what I was seeing from Canon in 2023 was kind of recycling and just trying to hit different price points so they could have cameras available at all different prices. So a lot of what Canon has been doing has to do with pricing and make sure they have a pricing tier so they can hit pretty much every price point, but they've also been reducing prices throughout the year. And at the time of recording this and late 2023, there's obviously, of course, a lot of holiday sales, but some of the prices have been significantly reduced overall. So starting with some of their cinema cameras, the C500 Mark II, which came out, I believe about four years ago, they reduced the price from 16,000 to $11,000, which was a huge difference. And I think this was good to keep it competitive with cameras like the Sony FX9. The C300 Mark III, was reduced in price from $11,000 to $9,000. The Canon C70 was released at $5,500. And then after a while, they started including the speed booster with it, which is a $600 accessory. So sort of a price reduction. And right now it's currently on sale for $5,300 with the speed booster. So in my opinion, there's, that's been reduced in price. The R5C had, has been all over the place with pricing. It got released at $4,500. It went up to $4,800, down to $4,300. It's often on sale for $3,800. Now it's currently on sale for $3,400. So the price is kind of all over the place there. And their mirrorless cameras, the R5, the R3, the R6 Mark II, the R7, the R8, all those cameras, they tend to fluctuate up and down uh, just with sales. And right now, a lot of them are on sale for the holidays and they do have a lot of... Um, good deals going on for, for the end of the year, but uh, the price just seems to be dropping on all their cameras. And it seems like their current strategy is trying to sell their cameras cheaper instead of putting out new competitive cameras. Now, Canon doesn't spend a lot on marketing and they don't really play the influencer marketing game, not even close to what Sony does. I think most of us are familiar with what's going on with uh, people making content about Sony and 
big events and stuff like that and trying to get more creators involved. So as of right now, at the end of 23, I think they're just trying to be competitive by lowering the prices. And this is kind of an interesting strategy and I'm not sure it's working or not. I guess we'd only know if we were inside Canon and looking at their numbers. Now, I know that R&D is expensive and does take a lot of time, but I believe that Canon sensors are kind of like one to two generations behind Sony. And this really does make sense because Canon got into the mirrorless game much later. Also, Sony makes sensors not only for themselves, but <laughs> for pretty much everybody else. So they're definitely leading in development. Now, I'm not alone in thinking this, but a lot of us users and customers feel like Canon doesn't really listen to the customers and what's going on in the market. They kind of just do their own thing. So here's what I think they need to do. The obvious. We need C-Log2. C-Log2 has more dynamic range and a nicer highlight roll off and more flexibility in post than C-Log3. I made a whole video about the history of Canon log curves and what I think they need to do. So if you're interested in that, I'll leave that video linked down below. In addition to going from C-Log3 to C-Log2, the cameras also need to technically have more dynamic range in the camera and not just going changing the log curves. Now, they need to be more competitive with the other cameras on the market. A lot of the Sony offerings and Lumix offerings, they have more dynamic range and all of the hybrid cameras is what I'm talking about here. The R8, the R62, the R5, the R5C, the R3, they need more dynamic range. And I think this will come with future development of the Canon sensors. They also need full-size HDMI ports. I think we could all agree that they need to stop putting the micro HDMI ports in there. For us video shooters, we use our HDMI ports a lot and they are not nearly as reliable when they put those little dinky ports in there. I would also have to see better menus and an operating system for video for their hybrid cameras. What we're using right now is sort of a, an adapted stills menu, which is kind of how all their cameras work. But a lot of things we would like, I would like to see improved. First of all, the histogram, which is as of right now, the only exposure tool in the, their hybrid mirrorless cameras. It shuts off after you press the record button. That's absolutely crazy. We also need waveforms and other, you know, uh, exposure tools. They did add false color in there in some of their newer cameras, which is great. I hope they continue that trend. That's a really nice thing to have in there. I would love to see shutter angle. I would also like to see an updated custom white balance. So as of right now, it's still their antiquated and cumbersome and not super accurate method where you have to take a photo and then go in the, it, it, it's such a pain. They already have this system that's a lot easier in their cinema operating system, which you find other ones too, where you can just hit the custom white balance button and you get a custom white balance. I would also like to see more options for time lapses and high frame rates. Right now we're kind of limited to just shooting in 30 frames per second and the log mode shoot, turns off in some situations. There just needs to be more flexibility. Essentially, they need to include SNF or slow and fast mode, uh, which is in their cinema operating system or something like SNQ in the Sony system. So you can really adjust everything and dial it in and uh, shoot log in some of these situations. And in addition to that, we just need better everything else in terms of tech specs and capabilities of the camera. So better low light, rolling shutter, et cetera. I'd also like to see some cool innovations coming out of Canon in 2024 to make them more competitive. Of course, the biggest thing I think most of us would love to see would be internal ND filters. As of right now, the only camera that has internal NDs and in-body image stabilization is the Sony Burano, which is a $25,000 cinema camera. I've seen some rumors about patents and stuff for Canon maybe putting this in their mirrorless cameras. That would be awesome. I would love to see that. And it'd be really cool to see Canon be the one that comes out with it first. Now, I would also like to see a lot more improvement in the autofocus in Canon cameras to make sure they're keeping up with Sony. I've seen rumors about a quad pixel autofocus, whatever that means, but there definitely needs to be some improvement in some ways with face tracking and things like that. I think they're in a good spot, but they can constantly need to improve on that to stay competitive. They do definitely need to work on their IBIS. You know, I find their IBIS system works really well in combination with the stabilized lenses but it, people have been really critical about the wobbles on the wide end with wide angle lenses. But for medium and telephoto, I think it works really, really well. And I, I love using it. I don't think it's quite at the level of Lumix's IBIS, but it's pretty good. I think they just need to keep working on it and try to take care of some of those wobbles. I would also like to see a new battery. So we've been using the LPE6N and then the newer version of that, the LPE6NH for a long time. But I think we either need some sort of newer battery technology or a slightly larger battery. These cameras are more and more powerful. And for us to have all these video features in them, we need a bigger battery or a better battery so the cameras last longer. Of course, the R5C is known for having a bad bad battery life. So I'd love to see um, you know better batteries. And like I said before, better menus for video. I don't know if that's going to be 
just using the cinema operating system like the R5C does, or maybe something different and um, just, you know, for their hybrid cameras. And maybe something else that I haven't thought of yet, Canon does like to innovate and come up with stuff. So I'm really excited to see whatever they come out with. So what camera would I like to see? Now, all of their cameras right now, their hybrids, they're, they're essentially photo first cameras with some cool video specs, and they kind of just hit at different price points with different amounts of features. What I'd love to see is what I'm calling the Canon FX3. So sort of like an FX3, but of course, you know, Canon camera. So what I mean by that is a video focused, full frame, compact hybrid camera with a fan. So of course, video focused, but it can take some photos. I would love to see it have 6K resolution, C-Log2, of course, a full size HDMI port and decent battery life. I think if Canon came out with a really small video focused hybrid camera, it would go a long way with content creators, videographers. I think it would hold on to a lot of their current customer base that are thinking about jumping ship to, you know, companies like Sony or Lumix. I also think it might bring some people into the Canon ecosystem that were hesitant because they don't really make a camera like that. The FX3 has been a just super successful camera for Sony and I'd love to see Canon make something similar. In addition, Canon really needs to come up with more RF mount cinema cameras this year. At the time of recording this, they only have two RF mount cinema cameras. There's the C70 and the R5C. Now I've owned and used both of these cameras a lot and I've made a lot of videos about them for this channel. The C70 is a fantastic camera. It's one of my all time favorite cameras, but I think it was kind of a happy accent for Canon and it's been really awesome for the company, but also a lot of the users. It's been widely accepted and used in a lot of different situations, has a lot of powerful tools in it and it just makes a great image, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement with that camera. The R5C is a powerful yet very quirky camera and it could have been a lot better hint into the Canon FX3. <laughs> but they just need more RF mount cinema cameras so that people can utilize their really awesome RF full frame glass. So for example, like the C500 Mark II is an EF mount camera. Would, I would love to see a version of that that has an RF mount so that people can take advantage of that really cool glass. I'd love to see them expand on the success of the Canon C70. I think most of us would love to see a full frame DGO sensor. The DGO technology provides unbelievable dynamic range and really clean shadows. In addition to that, some other RF cinema cameras, I would love to see a box design. I think a lot of people would love that. So something that's a little bit smaller and you can rig it up sort of like a red Komodo. And as of right now, like I said, there are only two RF mount cinema cameras. They definitely need more. So at the time of recording this, there are rumored to be two cameras coming out in early 2024 prior to the 2024 Olympics. Those of course would be the R5 Mark II and the R1. Now these are a long time coming and I've been following along with the rumors like everybody else. I have no clue if these are coming or what they are gonna be, but I do have a feeling that Canon is gonna put some really outrageous specs in there uh, just to really wow the market, kind of like they did with the 8K and the R5. But I think that these things probably will not be what most people want or use, but I think they will put something crazy in those cameras. So I'm really curious to see what those are. And I think all of us will be following along and waiting for them to release those cameras. I do wanna take a moment to talk about global shutter because there's been a lot of talk about this with the announcement of the Sony A9 Mark III. I've also seen that they may, the Canon may not be putting global shutters in their R1 and R5 Mark II. I think that might be the right call actually because them being a little bit behind in their sensor development, I would love to see some stacked sensors with quick readouts, but really focus on things like image quality, dynamic range, and high ISO performance. I would definitely like to see more dynamic range before I see a global shutter. And the sensor that's in the R3 is awesome. So I, they can definitely improve on the already, all the stuff they have going on with their stacked sensors. So now let's get on talking about lenses. And they did release quite a few lenses in 2023. Let's start with the RFS crop sensor lenses. There is the 10 to 18 f4.5 to 6.3 and the 55 to 210 f5 to 7.1. Now these were definitely needed for their crop sensor RF cameras. And you know, after the R7 came out, I was really hoping for more of these lenses, but we need more. And I'm always curious why they never make high-end APS-C lenses. So this never really happened for the EF lenses, so the EFS lenses, or for the RFS lenses we've seen so far. The only lens that was a little bit higher quality was the EFS 17 to 55 f2.8. Now Sony puts out higher end lenses for their APS-C system. They put out some G lenses. So I would love to see Canon put out some higher level APS-C lenses for cameras like the C70 and the R7. 
So there are three full frame lenses I want to mention here before we get onto the really expensive lenses. We have the RF 24 to 50 f 4.5 to 6.3 the RF 28 f 2.8 and the RF 200 800 f 6.3 to f 9. So first of all, the 24 to 50, I think is a great kit lens. I think it's an interesting focal length. I would have loved to see like 20 to 50, but it's cool to see them putting out new kit lenses. I would love to see Sony, for example, put out some new kit lenses. So that that is an option there for a lot of those cameras. The RF 28 is a cool pancake lens. I haven't tried it or the 24 to 50. And they had, did have an EF 28 F 2.8, and they also had a Pancake EFS 24 to 2.8. So the RF 28 seems like a really cool lens. It's not a very popular focal length. I personally love 28 millimeters, but uh, it is a really cool lens and pretty cheap. Of course, anytime you have a Pancake lens, you're giving up optical performance and quality, but it's cool to see that lens come out. Lastly is a lens that is coming out soon, the RF 200-800. This is a really unique lens. It does have a very slow aperture. It's not L quality, but really nobody else makes this lens. And I'm guessing they're really trying to compete with and beat the super popular Sony 200 to 600 G, which is 5.6 to 6.3. It's a little bit cheaper than that lens. It has a longer focal range. So I think that's really what they're trying to be competitive with. Now I was originally interested in this lens, but we'll see how good the image quality is with it after it ships. I'm guessing it's gonna be similar to like the 600 F11 and the 800 F11. Both are very unique lenses on their own. Now, lastly, onto their expensive and very unique lenses. They came out with three this year, the RF 100-300 f 2.8L, the RF 10-20 f4L, and the RF 24-105 f 2.8L. So let's talk about each of these lenses. The RF 100-300 is a really cool lens, but it's almost $10,000, and I think it has a very small market. But again, it's a lens that doesn't really exist and is gonna help be helpful for a small group of people. And I'm sure the optics are absolutely incredible on that. Then comes the 10 to 20 F4. This is a pretty pricey lens being over $2,000, but it is full frame, super wide, and it's stabilized. This again, I think has a very small market. I really wish this was like way cheaper and was actually a crop sensor lens, but it is a lens that they came out with. And then lastly, the RF 24 to 105 F2.8 LIS. I think it's kind of a holy grail lens. It's what a lot of people have been wanting for a long period of time. It is very large. It's also pretty expensive. And I don't know how many people are gonna buy it, but I think the people that do, are they're gonna use it in a lot of different situations. And I think really what I'm seeing from these three releases is Canon putting out high quality, unique lenses that really other people aren't making. And I think that's definitely part of their lens strategy. But what I think they really need to do is, what a lot of people out there also agree with me, is that they need to finish their lineup of standard L prime lenses. Now there are rumors of a 14, 24, 28, 35 L lens coming out, or the L lens is coming out, but it's kind of a joke at this point because they don't even have an RF 35 L or 24 L. And to put this in perspective, the last EF 35 1.4 L, which was the Mark II, came out in 2015. And the EF 24 1.4 L Mark II was the last 24 came out. It came out in 2008. And these are very common focal lengths that a lot of photographers and videographers like to own, a 24 and a 35. They really need to come out with those soon. Now the RF L zooms are great. I own a few of them. I absolutely love them. The 14 to 35, the 15 to 35, the 24 to 70, the 24 to 105, the 270 to 200s and the 100 to 500. Now the 2.8 zooms, as I said, are absolutely fantastic. I really love them and they do have stabilization, which is great, but they are rather large. And so if they do start making new versions of them, I hope they're a little bit smaller because as I said, they are pretty large, but Having stabilization is great, and the Sony GMs, a lot of them don't have stabilization, so that's a really nice thing to have in these lenses. As most of you know, the Canon has a lineup of budget prime lenses. We got the 16, 24, 35, 50, and 85, but I think a lot of us would like to see something in the middle. So they used to make an EF 50 F1.4, which is kind of in between their nifty 50, 50 F1.8, and their 50 1.2 L lens. I'd love to see some stuff right in the middle there. And if they don't come up with that stuff, I think this is really where the third party lenses come in, mainly Sigma with, they come out with all their art prime lenses that kind of are like half the price of the L lenses or maybe less and are almost as good image quality. So I think that would be, if they don't, if Canon doesn't come out with that, I'd love to see them start letting Sigma make those lenses. I think that would go a long way with, uh, with the Canon shooters. Now Canon does make some absolutely fantastic cameras and I do love using them but the market is changing and they need to focus more on video in their smaller and hybrid cameras. 
More and more people are hybrid shooters and doing more video. Even photographers nowadays are often asked to shoot some video clips, even if they don't want to. So they need to address this with future releases. And you really don't see many people talking about Canon for video on YouTube. And there's a few reasons for this. First of all, Sony Influencer game is very strong as most of you know, but this is not just influencer marketing hype. Sony cameras are often more convenient for video production and for content creation, and that's kind of why a lot of people wind up using them. And in a lot of areas, uh, people are mainly using Sony or RED for video productions. Not everywhere, and some people are just gonna use whatever they're used to, and they're not working with other teams, or they're just working for themselves, and so sort of stuff like that. But in a lot of places, this is the case that Sony's becoming more and more the default brand for video production. Now, firmware updates have been a big part of discussion in the camera world in the last year or two, especially when we're talking about Sony not putting their firmware updates in some of their more expensive cameras with features that are in their newer, less expensive cameras. But Canon has been absolutely fantastic about this, and there are a few schools of thoughts about this, but I think most people really do enjoy seeing firmware updates. It keeps their cameras more relevant longer, and it makes them think that the camera companies care a little bit more about the people that already bought their cameras. So Canon's been great. They even cannibalized their own lineup in some ways, like putting RAW in the C70, I think definitely hurt their C300 Mark III sales and probably bothered some of the C300 Mark III owners. But I'd love to see them continue this. Uh, the, the R5C has continued to evolve over time, become a much better camera. So I hope they keep up with this. It's been great. Anyways, here's my thoughts about what I think Canon needs to do in 2024 to be competitive. Let me know what you think down below. And I really appreciate you watching. If you did enjoy this, hit subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one.